Thanks for staying with us on The Real Story. We want to bring in our second guest right now, Senator Richard Blumenthal. Uh, Senator, thanks for being here. Thank you, Jen. Wonderful to be with you on a Sunday morning. Thank you. And remote. You haven't been on The Real Story yet since we've gone uh, virtual. So appreciate you calling in in this way. Uh, you were back in the state this past week, and we actually watched you take a COVID test on the New Haven Green with Mayor Justin Elliker. Uh, a nose swab, it looked uncomfortable. Uh, I would assume that it was negative. How fast did you find out and what was that, that, that process like? I learned the results within 24 hours. The results were negative, fortunately, but I'm very glad that I did it. I was not symptomatic, I felt fine, but we're now at a point where containing and stopping this insidious disease requires everyone to get this kind of test. Why? Because people may be infected without being symptomatic. And if we do testing and then contact tracing to locate anybody else who may be infected, we can make people feel safer and more secure. So they'll go back to schools and restaurants and workplaces without the kind of apprehension that they have right now. So I did it. It was, I'll be honest, uncomfortable and a bit awkward, but very painless. And I'm glad I did it because it will help others who might have been infected, if I had been infected, be safer. Where do you think Connecticut stands with access to testing compared to other states? Great question. Compared to other states, we're probably pretty good, maybe a little bit better. But none of the states, and really none of the nation, has as many tests as are needed. Right now, we have enough tests for the people who are asking for it. But the point is that more people should be asking for it and going to get tested, even if they're asymptomatic. And they will help others avoid this problem. To have that happen, we need many more tests. And in my view, the president needs to use the Defense Production Act, any other means of providing more tests, not only the kind that I took, which gives results within 24 hours, but also the quicker tests and the reliably efficient tests that may use saliva. There are a variety of different kinds of tests that will lead people to do it at home. Got to ask you this, Senator Fasano released a statement uh, last week and mentioned you, he was critical of you, saying, uh, questioning rather, the accuracy of comments you made about testing privacy. Uh, you had said that your test results are yours and your alone, and he felt like that was misleading the public uh, considering the state or the test results are shared with the state. Wanted to make sure you had a chance to, to answer that. Well, the test results are shared with other professionals, with the public health departments. They are not distributed publicly. They are not shared with strangers, and they can be used to do contact tracing. That much is true, but they are kept private in terms of sharing with for example, uh, the kinds of commercial uses that I think some people may fear that they are. All right, let's talk about the HEROES Act right now. It passed the House in Washington, and it doesn't look like it's going to be heard in the Senate as of yet. You, you and I were just talking. You're going to be back in Washington a week from Monday when the Senate will be in session, is what you had said. Uh, what's the future of the HEROES Act? I think the future of the HEROES Act ought to be very bright. In some form, this measure that's been passed by the House is big, it's bold, it's very, very important in so many different ways to provide a HEROES Fund, which I have championed for our frontline essential workers, the police, firefighters, doctors, nurses, the grocery store workers, and others who have put themselves in harm's way they deserve to be recognized and rewarded, and we want to retain them and recruit others. So 
that hazardous duty pay, I think, is very important in a HEROES Fund as part of the HEROES Act, but also more aid for hospitals, which are on the precipice of economic disaster, more aid for states and localities, $3.9 billion for Connecticut municipalities alone. And that will be important in replenishing those funds that have been spent on coronavirus, but also avoiding tax increases and massive layoffs, which otherwise would occur, police, fire, and other essential services like teachers, which will result if we do not pass the HEROES Act. And finally, another stimulus payment. People need that kind of payment to put food on the table and pay rent and utilities and more money for small businesses. I've been strongly advocating more flexibility, which fortunately the House again passed this week, the PPP flexibility program to give them more time to hire workers, more time to pay back money, and more time to comply with other features of the act. All of this comprehensive reform should be voted on by the Senate, passed by the Senate, signed into law, because it's essential for reopening our economy, but also turning the tide on this insidious pandemic. And more testing as well is tremendously important. As of right now, you were saying that Mitch McConnell will not be bringing it to the floor of the Senate. Is there any hope that people can convince him to do that? And, uh, you know, what's his reasoning you're hearing for not wanting to bring uh, the HEROES Act to the floor? Mitch McConnell says we should take a pause, that we should see how the money that we've already allocated is spent and how impactful it is. And Unfortunately, this disease is not taking a pause, nor is the free fall of our economy. So we need to have this kind of aid to state and local governments like Connecticut, like our major municipalities, but also small towns that will lay off essential workers. And uh, I think the future actually for this proposal is brighter than a lot of people may suspect from what he has said, because at every one of these relief packages, the $8 billion that was the first one, the family's first measure that was $100 billion, the CARES Act, $2.2 trillion, the interim package, every one of them began with either Republican or Democratic proposals, and we worked hard, we made them bipartisan, we came together. I hope, and I really believe, that we can come together on this one too and pass it by an overwhelming bipartisan majority, just as we did the last two, in fact, unanimously. So I'm very, very hopeful. I think what will make the difference is the public pressure that Mitch McConnell feels from constituents across the country, including Kentucky, his state and local governments, his hospitals, his workers need this kind of relief fund. We're still in that recovery mode. And I think he's going to feel it in his state. And every other state is going to make their views known to their members of the United States Senate. And I hope that voice, the collective voice, will be heard by my colleagues. So, Senator, this um, fund, this compensation fund, is directly for frontline workers, correct? It is for essential frontline workers, hazardous duty pay. But when you talk about a compensation fund, I also believe, in addition to that hazardous duty pay, that there ought to be the kind of fund we established after 9-11. Here's why I think it's important. A lot of these frontline workers are going to suffer from post-traumatic stress. What they have been through is truly horrific. Think of the docs and nurses, the police and fire who've been dealing with this pandemic in real time, in real terms. We've all endured the hardship and heartbreak, but these folks may have lasting repercussions in terms of health. They may have results from infections, but also from the mental stress. And frankly, some of these families may have lost loved ones among those essential workers. They ought to have the kind of compensation fund that we established after 9-11. So I have proposed, and I've led the effort in the Senate, for a compensation fund, a pandemic relief compensation fund, 
that will provide this kind of 9-11 type aid for people who may have suffered health effects or unfortunately, tragically, suffered losses of family members, just as we've done for the 9-11 workers. And one of them, actually, Trooper Bacon, passed away this week from Ansonia here in Connecticut from cancer that he contracted at uh, Ground Zero. And I think we ought to be mindful that these losses from the 9-11 first responders, fire and police are still with us. And the kinds of effects of this problem may be with us with the frontline workers in the pandemic as well. All right, Senator Richard Blumenthal, we appreciate you coming on the program and catching us up. Uh, I know people are still looking to see if there's going to be more stimulus payments directly to consumers, considering uh, those did go out. But the, the crisis is still here. The pandemic is still here. So please keep us updated on that. But we have run out of time. Uh, so thanks for joining us and keep us updated. That's going to do I'm it for this fighting. week's edition of The Real Story. And uh, please tune in next week. We'll be here for you. And if you want to watch one of the segments with Bob Stefanowski or Senator Richard Blumenthal, you can go online, fox61.com. Thank you.